an honor to be here today. Um, I've watched plenty of TED Talks, and to be actually able to give one is truly a treat. Now, the story I'm going to tell you about today is one that has actually changed my idea of conservation. So what happens to us on a daily basis is we are bombarded with information, actually a lot of bad information about what is happening to our planet, in particular our oceans. And many of these things we've recognized for decades. So when we hear about it over and over again, we think, is anything ever going to get better? How can we fix this? And it becomes actually very discouraging as a scientist who's trying to study these things to figure out how we can make things better. So the problem is we have a growing problem. Uh, human population has been exponentially increasing. We're heading towards 9 billion people on the planet, and those people have to eat. So we've been taking things from the ocean. California is no different. California has shown exponential growth at, in terms of its human population. We are now over 38 million people in California, and a vast majority of those live right along the coastline, which means they have needs for the coast and have impacts for the coast. So shark populations, as a result of this growing problem, uh, ha have experienced a lot of issues. They've experienced overfishing, where we've directly gone out and targeted them. They've been influenced by bycatch, where they're unintentionally caught but thrown over dead. Pollution, habitat loss, even displacement has affected shark populations. So the, the tricky part about this is sharks are easy to overfish. They're different than many of the other things that we like to eat, mainly because they're like us. They take a long time to reach sexual maturity. They can live to be 70 to 100 years old. They grow very slowly, and they produce very few young over their lifetime. So in many ways, they're a lot like humans. This makes them easy to overexploit. But the other part is, because of their reputation they have among people, it makes it easier for us to justify going out and killing them, because occasionally sharks bite humans. So this was all also fueled by Jaws, which was uh, written in 1975, and then produced as a movie by Steven Spielberg in 76. And I want to point out, Steven, go beach, an alum, actually got a lot of his information about Hooper from the shark lab that was here in 1969. So it was actually this information that has made it, I think, easier to eliminate sharks from our ocean. So as the result of these decades of overharvesting, we are now in a situation where populations in many places are in dire straits. The interesting thing is people's attitudes towards sharks are changing because people do care about this. They see this as a problem and they want to see changes. So they're worried about shark populations being in peril. Now the thing that makes sharks important is that they're part of the food chain and quite often they're at the top of the food chain. Now the interesting thing about being at the top is that you're sensitive to everything else that happens in the ocean because you're reliant on it for food. So what we've ha what's happened over time is humans have systematically eliminated all the predators in the food chain, mainly because they're good to eat, but uh, also because they're incidentally caught. We end up with a food web that's out of whack. So sharks actually are very sensitive organisms in terms of understanding the health of the ocean. So ha what happens to them tells us a lot about the health of the ocean. Humans, of course, We've fed our way through the food web, and we feed at all levels. So now I want to talk about the animal at the top of the heap. That's the white shark. Now, California is host to probably one of the largest white shark populations in the world. So 20 years ago, if you'd asked a shark biologist what kind of shark we thought a white shark was, we would have said they're a coastal shark. And the reason you'd say that is because in the fall months, we would see sharks around the Farallon Islands, around San Francisco, and in Uevo. And then there's an island off Baja called Guadalupe Island. So these sharks are coming to these areas, we believe, to take advantage of some seasonal nourishment. So elephant seals, sea lions, harbor seals will come in shore at that time of year, give birth to their young, and the sharks are waiting because the young are easy targets for them. And because they're nice and fat, they're a great meal for the sharks. But it wasn't until the advent of satellite telemetry that many of my colleagues started to tag these sharks around these islands, and we found out that white sharks aren't coastal sharks after all. They actually spend only a few months around these islands and then venture all the way out into the middle of the Pacific or go to Hawaii, not a bad move, spend their entire winters out there, 
and spend between eight months to a year and a half before venturing back to one of those aggregation sites. Now, the other reason why white sharks come back to California is because Southern California is the nursery. This is where they come and give birth to their young. Now, what makes white sharks kind of important in this sense is that they're at the very top of the food chain in our ocean, but they're very vulnerable to overfishing because they're much like us. They have life history characteristics like us. They're slow growing, produce very few young, but when they are caught, they are of value. So for example, a pair of white shark jaws can sell for $16,000. Their fins, their dried fins for soup fin, sell for as much as $200 a pound. So for an adult white shark, that could be $6,000 just for the fins, $16,000 for the jaws. Now, there are not a lot of top predators out there. That's the nature of the way the food web works. But they have been incidentally caught in some commercial fisheries. And when they are caught, because they're of value, they have historically been landed. So what always surprises me is that back in 1994, despite the fact that white sharks have an occasional uh, propensity to nibble on people, we had the wherewithal to enact protection for white sharks in 1994 in the state of California because we recognized how vulnerable they were to overfishing. They were protected in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic in 1997. They were protected under CITES, so their parts or teeth or jaws could not be internationally trafficked in 2004, and they were protected throughout the rest of US waters in 2005. So for 10 to 20 years, white sharks have been afforded protection because we understand their importance and their vitalness to the ocean. Now I wanna tell you about a story. So commercial fisheries, that's what California's original economy was based on, commercial fishing. We've had a history of fisheries coming and going, but the gillnet fishery is a really good example. So the gillnet fishery in California started in the 70s, really with the advent of plastic. So gillnet is basically an invisible net that fishers put in the water. The fish swim into it and they get caught around their gills. Unbelievably effective method of fishing. Now this fishery started in the 70s, grew to its peak in the mid 80s, and then crashed in the 90s because it was so effective, they basically overfished the things they were targeting. The fishery became quickly overcapitalized, and as a result, we saw declines in the things that they were targeting, like swordfish and sharks offshore, and inshore, things like white sea bass and halibut, things that we like to eat. So uh, what really cooked this fishery was bycatch. When the public found out they were killing lots of sea lions, dolphins, birds, and other species that weren't landed, the public was upset. And in 1994, the voters of California banned the use of gillnets in nearshore waters. Exactly. So one of the things that we found when we looked through the records of fishing records where white sharks may interact with a fishery is that that gillnet fishery had the greatest impact. In fact, majority of the sharks caught in that gillnet fishery were babies and they were landed and sold in fish markets as sharks back prior to the 1994. If we look at fishing effort, that's the dotted line you see, as fishing effort goes up, the number of nets in the water goes up, a lot of sharks are being caught being landed in the fishery, but as the fishery begins to decline because they're overfishing, we see sharks start to decline. So remember in 1994, white sharks were protected and gillnets were banned in nearshore waters. If we look at after 1994, gillnet fishing still occurs off our coast, it's really important, it provides us with good fresh fish. That effort has not changed. It's been reduced by 82% since its peak. But look at the number of sharks being incidentally caught in that fishery. It's been going up and up and up. Now, when I looked at this at first, I thought, well, man, this looks like the population's going up. If there's more babies, there has to be more mommies. But it didn't resound with me because I'm telling people shark populations are in trouble all around the world. I did not believe my own data. So, but believe it or not, there's other good evidence that shark populations are increasing. So for example, we've had the public, during the summer, my phone rings off the hook. Oh my God, there's a white shark off the beach. Uh, the lifeguards are pulling people out of the water. What should we do? And I say, well, actually this is a good sign. This is a sign that the population is probably increasing. So this is one of the few places in the world where you can stroll down Manhattan Beach or Venice Beach Pier or uh, Hermosa Beach Pier and you can walk out in the summer and you have the chance of actually looking down and seeing a baby white shark. There is nowhere else in the world you can go see that and it's in our front yard. In addition, the other evidence that we have that the shark population is increasing besides just the fisheries data and what people see 
is the fact that there are a lot of marine mammals out there that are showing up on our beaches every year with bite marks from adult white sharks. So every summer, the number of animals washing up on the beach is increasing. And in fact, on along the central coast, the sea otter population has been steadily increasing in terms of shark attacks on sea otters. So all these pieces of information tell us that the shark population is probably increasing. So the question I began to ask is, because at first I didn't believe my data, I had to look at these other pieces. But the question I started to ask is, is protection from fishing enough to allow the population to recover the way we're seeing? And then I thought, well, but, but they can't recover if there's no food. The public's being told all the time our coastal ocean is overfished, so how can this be? <laughs> well, when you look at things like marine mammals, which by the way, white shark's favorite food, it's like uh, fried food for us, very fatty, rich, they love it. Um, marine mammals were hunted to the verge of extinction by the early 1900s throughout all U.S. waters pretty much globally. And in fact, I use California sea lion as an example. In 1920, beach estimates estimated that there were as few as 2,000 California sea lions left in all of California and Baja. They had been hunted to the verge of extinction. If a fisherman saw them, they simply shot them. They used them as competitors. But what happens in 1973? The Marine Mammal Protection Act is passed. Look at that sharp uptick in California sea lion population because people aren't shooting them anymore. The population's going up. We see this little dip in the mid 80s. We had a strong El Nino. What are we having right now? Strong El Nino. That's gonna put a dent in our sea lion population. Uh, major gill net regulations go into place in the mid 90s. They were catching and incidentally killing lots of sea lions. But look at the population growth after that. At the time we're telling the public our coastal oceans are overfished, the most voracious carnivore we have in our coastal waters is growing at a rate of 6.5% per year, which we thought was impossible. NOAA has now concluded that they've reached their carrying capacity at between 220 to 370,000 California sea lions. So they went from being on the verge of extinction to completely recovered in a period of 100 years. Now, how can this predator be able to show that kind of population recovery if there's nothing for them to eat? Well, if we look at many of the other fisheries that have occurred in California, and we take the gillnet fishery as an example, things like white sea bass, which was the target, were significantly impacted by the gillnet fishery. But since the ban in 1994, we're seeing a steady increase in white sea bass. Well, baby white sharks eat baby white sea bass, and we love white sea bass too, so it kind of makes sense. But when we look at the other species that were incidentally caught in gill nets, like giant black sea bass, soup fin sharks, leopard sharks, all their populations are going up, and have been going up since that one regulatory management practice that we put in place, and that was the banning of nearshore gill nets. But is that enough to provide the food that those animals need to show population recovery? No, we tell people all the time, if you have polluted water, populations are gonna be affected. Believe it or not, California had the worst water quality anywhere in the country in the early 70s, and the reason is, we have 22 million people living along our coastline. Every day you flush the toilet, you turn the tap, it goes out five pipes. We had some of the worst water quality because we were discharging raw sewage less than a mile offshore. This had major impacts on our coastal environment. Californians, like many other Americans, would not stand for that. In addition, we had industry that were dumping hundreds of tons of contaminants into the ocean. So Californians led a charge to Washington to push forward the Clean Water Act. Opponents of that act argued, you cannot put these regulations in place, you'll crush the US economy. Well, here we are. Granted, Southern California with 22 million people all have secondary and in some cases tertiary wastewater treatment. We have the best wastewater treatment that exists anywhere on the planet considering the population density. And even though we still have problems with urban runoff and trash, we have water significantly cleaner today than we did back in the 70s with three times more people living in coastal California. So when you look at all these things together, you would say, it looks like the reason why the white shark population is increasing is because our ocean is getting healthier. So is it just California? Actually, no. We're seeing this nationwide. Shark populations, where there are shark fisheries in the Atlantic, have been steadily going up since management has been put into place. And I'll use a good example, my hometown, New England, where there's been a 
dramatic recover of white shark. So I grew up on Martha's Vineyard, and I fished every single beach when I was a kid. Never in my entire growing up did I ever see a gray seal. Now there are thousands of gray seals that use Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and there are populations, a fairly decent-sized population of adult white sharks that are taking advantage of those seals. So I think these are good examples of population recovery of predators. Our predators are coming back. We've systematically eliminated them. We did things to the ecosystem that made them vulnerable. And we've remediated for a lot of those things. As a result of better air quality, better water quality, better fisheries management, our predators are returning. Now remember, each and every one of those practices that were put in place weren't put in place to bring white sharks back. They were put in place to fix individual problems, but together they formed this sort of ecosystem management plan that's been working over the last 50 years. So people are asking me, well, why are we seeing so many sharks now? Well, it takes decades for these populations to recover. So the question I looked at was, has all this management made a difference? Because we hear about the bad news about everything that's happening to our environment. All these management plans in the late 60s, early 70s, and again the 90s have been put in place. We pay taxes for them. But believe it or not, we have a cleaner environment now than we would have had we not put this legislation in place. So I would argue that the recovery of the white shark population is probably California's greatest conservation success story that we have to offer. So I'm sorry, California Condor, you're gonna have to move out of the way because there's a new success story in town. But with that comes these other challenges. If shark populations are recovering, we have two generations of Americans that have had basically unfettered access to the ocean. It's been our playground. We are now using it for all sorts of recreational opportunities and activities, and we hadn't had to deal with a recovering predator population. But things are changing. One of the things that we're seeing, not just nationwide, but globally, is a slight increase in the rate of shark attacks on humans. So what this means is with all our water activities and with recovering shark populations, that is actually going to increase. But we have to remember, we've spent a lot of time and money to bring these predators back. We have done a lot in terms of educating the public about their importance, and we don't want to go backwards. And I'll give you an example, Western Australia, with their shark culling programs to try to keep people safe. Those programs do not work. What we have to do is become predator educated again, and we use good science to educate the public so that you can be safe when you use the ocean. Remember, it's their home. We're visitors. We have to learn to share the waves. Thank you.